Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight for our webinar with Nicole Rea. I just want to make sure before we start that everybody has the captioning pod open. Um, if you don't, please click on the CC button at the top for captioning. Um, and we'll go ahead and get started. I know Nicole has a lot of uh, slides to get through. Um, but just to, by way of introduction, Nicole Rea is a clinical audiologist at University Hospital in New York, New Jersey. And she's here this evening to present audiological evaluations, findings, and recommendations, a parent's guide. So without further ado, go ahead and hit it, Nicole. Thank you again. Thank you, Nancy. Um, it really was an honor to be asked to speak to you tonight. One of my goals as a pediatric audiologist is to try to help parents understand not only their child's hearing loss and what they can and cannot hear, but um, in order to make informed decisions, but also so that they can explain to their family, friends, and other professionals not only the type of hearing loss that their child has or the degree of hearing loss, but how that affects them. Um, so I do hope that you can take some of that information um, from this webinar. And, and also, I look forward to your feedback. You know, it's one thing for a parent to be able to say that their child has um, a mild bilateral sensory neural hearing loss. Um, but it's really quite another for that child for that parent to be able to say, you know, that means that she may hear you or may understand your speech when it's a quiet room, but when there's noise in the background, it'll be a little bit harder. So please, you know, let's try to limit background noise and uh, face her when you're speaking. And that really is the ultimate goal of what and how you can empower your child. Um, so as we go through tonight's information, I want you, of course, I know that you'll be thinking of your child or your children with hearing loss. Um, but just keep in mind that not all of these types of assessments that we're going to go through um, are conducted at every audiological appointment. Um, these are also not the be-all and end-all of audiological testing. There are many other types that, of testing that are conducted, um, but this is really the basics. So tonight, first, we're going to go through anatomy of the ear. Um, and, and really, I want to do that because it's important for us to understand how hearing occurs in the child with normal hearing, so then we can understand where the problem may be occurring in a child with hearing loss. Um, and then we'll go through our different types of audiological assessment, including objective testing and subjective testing. Uh, we'll go through audiogram interpretation, you know, what does that graph really mean? Um, and then recommendations. And those will be both general um, and things that I hope that as a parent with a child with of hearing loss somebody has made to you, um, but also some other recommendations that we as audiologists may make but may not necessarily be clear. All right, so the very basics of the anatomy of the ear, and it can be a little daunting. So this is an ear. Imagine that you're looking at the child. Okay, so if this ear had a face, um, this is, well, you're looking at the left side, but really is considered to be the patient's right ear. Okay, so this is the oracle or the pinna, and its main, paper, main purpose is to funnel sound into your ear canal, which is right here. And this leads up to your eardrum or the, the tympanic membrane. So this whole portion, um, this outside portion, is considered to be the outer ear. The level of the eardrum is really the midpoint, at which point we're entering to the middle ear cavity. And that middle ear consists of three ossicles, or bones, and they're the smallest bones in your body. They're called the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. Um, and the middle ear is primarily an air-filled space that's encased within bone. Um, and it contains your eustachian tube. And the eustachian tube is very important for aeration of the middle ear. And it leads into the throat. Um, so in children who Nicole, I think we lost audio. OK, here, little blip in the audio. Can you hear me? Is that better now? Yes, I can hear you now. Also, um, Nicole, I just wanted to let you know that there is um, some pointers right there next to your PowerPoint if you wanted to um, use one of the pointers. If you'll 
you can see those on the side. All right, go ahead and oh, continue. Perfect. I'll turn off my mic. Okay. Um, so I'm not sure at which point I lost everyone, so I'll just start again very quickly for you. Um, so again, this is the pinna or the auricle, the outermost portion of the ear that funnels sound, and it leads into the ear canal. Your ear canal leads at the tympanic membrane or your eardrum. So this whole portion is considered to be the outer ear. Your middle ear starts um, at the, really at the plane of the tympanic membrane, and that contains three bones, your malleus, which is right here, your incus, and the smallest bone, the stapes. Um, and this middle ear cavity is usually an air-filled space, um, and that's monitored by the eustachian tube right here. And your station tube is what leads to the back of the throat. So in children who are getting conductive hearing loss um, because of fluid buildup, this is the means by which that fluid is entering the middle ear. So your stapes right here, the smallest bone, is actually oval in shape at what's called a foot plate. And this pushes on your innermost ear, in the inner part of the ear, um, called the cochlea. And your cochlea consists of actually two organs, your hearing organ, which is right here, and the balance center, which is right here. There are, there's a third canal that's actually hidden in this photo. And then, of course, beyond the level of the cochlea, we have the auditory nerve, which leads to the brain. Uh, just as a point of reference for you, this is how small your ossicles really are. You can fit all three of them on the head of a dime, and your cochlea is considered to be just as small because you can fit on a euro cent or also on a dime. Um, so we're talking about a very, very small but very powerful area. Um, and it still amazes me that how small this cochlea is, but it's, it, it uh, has to do with so much with our hearing and with our balance center. So if you cut the cochlea in half, um, it's important to realize that it's not one common cavity. There are actually, um, along that spiral, multiple cavities. And so if you did cut it, this is what it would look like. And of course, right here is the auditory nerve. So if we're looking at one of those cross sections or those cuts um, in just one of those circular areas, you'll see that there are three sections, your scale of vestibuli, your scale of tympani, and those both contain um, a fluid called perilymph. And then your middle port right here, the scale of media, contains a different kind of fluid, um, and this is called endolymph. So when we're talking about, you know, hair cells, we're usually talking about the outer hair cells located within the cochlea, and they would be right here. Um, and usually when that stapes foot plate pushes, it displaces the fluid in your ear, um, in the cochlea itself. And when that fluid moves, those hair cells dance, and that dancing sends a signal along the auditory nerve. So that's how normal hearing occurs. Um, and when we have a child with hearing loss, there's a disruption somewhere along that auditory pathway. And it's not the same for every child, and it can occur in, in different places. So we're just going to move on to some um, objective assessment now. And an obje objective assessment is any kind of testing that doesn't require um, a patient response. It's equipment driven. So there are four main types of objective audiological assessment. Uh, tympanometry, acoustic reflex testing, and otoacoustic emissions. And these three are primarily conducted during routine audiological evaluations. And then you have what we call our specialized test, which is the auditory brainstem response. So this is a photograph of what's called a tympanometer, or it can be called an emittance bridge. Um, and this is used for both tympanometry and acoustic reflex testing. So tympanometry is a relatively quick test. Um, we, can be, we can perform it either first during the evaluation or last. It really depends on the child. Generally, I will perform it last if I'm first meeting the child, but then as the first thing that we do after I've established a rapport and if I'm seeing the child again. Um, what it requires is me to put a probe in the, in the child's ear. You can see it down here. Um, and it can be scary. You know, Children don't know who I am. They've just met me. I'm bringing them into this scary room that's you know, very quiet, and they don't know what's going to happen. So if I can just establish a rapport and test the child and see that it's fun, then we can do tympanometry and show that it's really quick. It doesn't hurt, um, and it can be a little, we can make it a game. 
So tympanometry is a test of middle ear health, specifically tympanic membrane or eardrum movement. Um, and it gives us, it's a plot. So it gives us three kinds of information. It tells us how much pressure is required to make that eardrum move, how much is that eardrum able to move, and that's known as peak compliance, and what's that size of that ear canal or ear canal volume. And all three um, are very important information. In a child or an adult with normal middle ear health, you should see that the pressure should be about the same as the pressure in a room. Um, and that's because of that function of that eustachian tube. So when we perform tympanometry, which is very, very quick, um, you get a graph that hopefully looks something like this. And this is indicative of normal middle ear pressure, which is on the x-axis, and admittance, which is on the y. Then we have two subtypes of type A tympanogram. And remember, just like when you're in school, A is good. You have our shallow A, or an AS, where you have normal pressure, but that eardrum isn't able to move as well as it should be. Um, and we, know, we call this a hypocompliant middle ear system, or a stiff middle ear system. And this can happen for a couple of different reasons. Um, there are certain different conditions that can restrict eardrum movement such as otosclerosis or ossicles that don't move well. Um, severe scarring of your eardrum can cause this if the child has had multiple ear infections and multiple tympanic membrane perforations. Um, or it can happen if there's something that's pushing against the eardrum, such as a bead or any other kind of foreign body in the ear canal. So the opposite of an AS tympanogram is an AD tympanogram or an ADEEP. And again, you have that normal middle ear pressure, but you have a very flaccid or a hypermobile tympanic membrane. And this is most common um, in children who have suffered, suffered head trauma when those ossicles or those ear bones become dislocated and they're no longer suspended in the middle ear cavity. Um, and that's known as an as ossicular discontinuity. Type AS tympanograms and type D tympanograms aren't as common for children. Um, they do occur. What's more common are our type C tympanograms and our type B tympanograms. So let's start with the type C. The type C uh, refers to when there's negative middle ear pressure, but normal peak compliance. So that eardrum is able to move, but it takes more pressure than normal, more pressure than the, in the atmosphere to cause that eardrum to move. Um, sometimes we refer to it as a wait and see. Um, just because you want to see if the movement goes back to a normal movement or if that eardrum becomes less mobile, um, as can happen when there is fluid behind the eardrum. It's usually temporary, um, but it can become chronic if the child is prone to middle ear effusions or fluid again behind the eardrum. In children who have chronic middle ear effusions or fluid behind the eardrum, we also tend to see uh, a type B tympanogram. And you should just know that there are three types of type B tympanograms, because we have to be a little more confusing. Um, a type B tympanogram literally just means that that middle ear isn't able to, that that eardrum isn't able to move, or it's a non-compliant middle ear system. It has to always have a statement on the ear canal volume. In a child with a type B tympanogram at a normal volume, that's consistent with a non-moving eardrum, whether it be from fluid um, or something else that's not blocking the size of the ear canal. If you have a type B tympanogram with a small volume, um, that's indicative of a couple of different things. It can happen because a child has a stenotic or a narrow ear canal. It can happen because of in impacted cerumen or earwax which is very common in children who have sensory neural hearing loss and weird hearing aids that block that ear canal. Or it can happen because kids are kids and they stick things in their ears and then they have a foreign body um, within the ear canal. If an audiologist measures a type B tympanogram with a large volume, it's consistent with a hole in the eardrum, whether that be from a patent or open pressure equalizing tube um, that was placed by an ENT because of chronic otitis media or middle ear effusions. Or it can happen because there's just a hole in the eardrum for a variety of reasons. 
And again, this is just a photograph of that type B tympanogram, so you really don't have that movement. There is no peak at which point, um, there's no peak pressure at which that eardrum can be made mobile. So generally when we're testing tympanometry, we will test one ear, and then we'll make a decision of whether or not we're going to test acoustic reflexes, and then we'll go back to the opposite ear and test tympanometry and acoustic reflexes. And again, this is all using the same admittance bridge. So an acoustic reflex is the, a measure of the lowest volume or intensity that a sound can be um, generated to stimulate the stapedius muscle, and that's called the acoustic reflex threshold. Um, the stapedius muscle is a protective mechanism that's used to protect the cochlea from prolonged exposure to loud sound. So think of any time that you've gone to a concert and you've left and you're having difficulty hearing that's most likely because your stapedius muscle is contracted. It's protecting your ear um, against loud sounds. So we want to know what's the lowest level that we can stimulate that reflex. Um, and it allows us to assess the integrity of the ascending or afferent um, auditory pathway and the descending auditory pathway um, to the level of the lower brainstem. And we test this two ways, ipsilaterally, which means that the probe and the sound come from the same ear, or contralaterally, in which case the child has what looks like a probe in both ears, but one ear um, presents the signal and the other ear records the response. We test this at multiple frequencies, um, and it's generally elevated or absent in patients with sensory neural hearing loss. Um, that's a greater than a mild loss. When we're testing acoustic reflexes, we can also test the integrity of that muscle. How well is that muscle able to stay contracted in response to a prolonged loud sound? And that's um, referred to as acoustic reflex decay. There are different uh, testing considerations that we need to make when we're thinking, when we're deciding whether or not we're going to test acoustic reflexes in a child. Um, it requires a child to sit very quietly. I always tell them, you're going to sit like a statue for a prolonged period of time, hopefully a minute to two minutes, but potentially longer. They may be absent in a child with poor middle ear function. I generally don't test acoustic reflexes if that patient does not have a type A tympanogram. Um, usually we don't test them if the child has a patent PE tube, and that's just because we're putting a loud sound in the child's ear, and we want to make sure that we're not causing any kind of damage to loud sounds. We also want to be very aware that, in a small, especially a small child who has a, a hearing loss, that they don't experience recruitment or which is um, an adverse reaction to a loud sound. So we want to make sure that we're watching the child, if the child looks like they're in distress while we're testing will discontinue. Again, if we're doing acoustic reflexes and tympanometry before our actual hearing test, I don't want to do anything that's going to upset your child right off the bat because if we upset them, essentially our, our session is over. Ambient noise in the room isn't a factor. We can sing to the child, mom and dad, we have talked to them. We can even put a video on that may or may not have sound. So next we're going to talk a little bit about otoacoustic emissions. Um, and generally this is conducted after your tympanometry because again, we're not always testing otoacoustic emissions and we certainly do not want to test if there is poor middle ear function. So OAEs, as they're known, are a valid and widely used screening tool in the uh, newborn hearing screening population or UNHS. Um, but they also use diagnostically. They do not diagnose a hearing loss, though. They have to be used in conjunction with other forms of assessment. They allow the audiologist to comment on the integrity of the outer hair cells, or OHCs. And remember, those are those little cells within the cochlea that are actually moving in response to sound. Um, it's very important to realize that the inability to elicit or to measure an OAE does not mean that they are truly absent. It's just that they could not be measured, and that could happen for a variety of reasons that we're going to talk about right now. Um, so again, they're clinically significant, and they're widely used in the well AD nursery um, and with children. They allow the audiologist to comment on the function of each cochlea, 
when we can't obtain ear specific information. Um, most often that's happening when we're testing pure tones out of speakers or what's called in the sound field. And we'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. Um, they're usually absent in patients with more than a mild sensory neural hearing loss. Having said that, they're usually present in children and adults with a mild sensory neural hearing loss, um, which is why they're used in conjunction with behavioral testing, but not in isolation. And also when we're monitoring children um, who are receiving chemotherapy, they're used um, generally because the otoacoustic emission will disappear before a hearing loss manifests. So what actually is an OAE? It's literally an echo. Um, when the outer hair cells move in response to sound, that movement of those cells produces a sound um, because energy has been moved. So if you think of it like when you're moving a desk, your goal is to move the desk across the floor, but it's heavy and you can't lift it. So when you're pushing it across the floor, you're causing a sound to occur. The sound's not the goal. You actually want to push the desk. Um, it, the desk, the, that sound is just a byproduct of you, of you moving the desk. So that's literally what we're doing. We're measuring the byproduct. And we're measuring the, the change that happens when those hair cells move within the cochlea. But we have to be careful because if we lose too much energy, then we're not going to be able to measure the emission. And how do we, so how do we lose that energy? Most of the times we're losing it because of noise, whether it be I'm talking during testing or um, somebody's cell phone rings, the child says, oh, I hear that. Um, those are all things that, we'll, that we have to limit. And that includes myogenic or patient-centered noise. And that's also child the child's moving, or if they're very congested or a mouth breather, sometimes we'll measure artifact instead of a response. Um, as well as the other people in the test room. Um, so to, in order to successfully elicit an OAE, the stimulus must be sufficiently higher than the noise floor. And of course, like everything else, we have our limitations with OAEs. We can't measure them if there's poor outer or middle ear function. Uh, we cannot use them to estimate auditory thresholds. There is no correlation between your uh, the level at which, how much of an emission you have and your audiogram. OAEs will be present in the presence of a mild sensory neural hearing loss, um, and it's one of the things that we hate as audiologists. We know that unfortunately we're missing children when we're testing with universal newborn hearing screening who have a mild hearing loss because we don't have a test that's sensitive enough, sensitive enough for it. Um, and they're not sensitive to hearing losses that occur beyond the level of the cochlea. Um, which is called a retrocochlear hearing loss because we're just measuring how much those, those hair cells are moving. So this is a graph of our present otoacoustic emission. Right here you have your stimulus. So this is a nice stable stimulus. This is your, uh, your emission or your response. And then this is your noise floor. So you can see the difference between the emission and the noise floor. When you compare that to an OAE that's measured in a noisy environment, if you look, your stimulus is still nice and stable. But right here, this line right here, and I think it's easier to see with these two frequencies, this isn't your emission. This is your noise floor. This is your emission. So if you see, if your noise is higher than your, your response or the emission, it's not a true response. And you're considered to say that your OAEs are absent. Um, this is another way of looking at very similar information. So your blue here is the response, and the red is the noise floor. Horizontally, you have your frequency or your pitch, 1,000 hertz, 1,500, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, uh, 5,000, and 6,000 hertz. And then you have it's, the response here is dB, but don't think of it as dB as in an audiogram. It's just the difference of the response. Um, so you can see that you have present autoacoustic emissions at 1,000, 1,500, and 2,000 hertz. That's great. In most screening protocols, this child would pass a hearing screening if they're testing five frequencies. The problem comes that your emissions are really absent from 3,000 to 6,000 hertz. So this is, could very well be a child who has either normal hearing or a mild hearing loss from 1,000 to 2,000 hertz 
and then it slopes to say a moderate, moderately severe sensory neural hearing loss. So it's really something that you want to be careful of, and we need to be careful of as audiologists when we're testing and assessing for autoacoustic emissions. Okay, so we're going to move on, test our OAEs to our auditory brainstem response. Um, and remember, this is a test that's not conducted as part of the routine audiological evaluation. When you call and say, my pediatrician told me I need to come for a hearing test, this is not the test we're going to do right away. Um, this is a test that we use to, you know, to confirm hearing loss and to establish our thresholds. So the, uh, the auditory brainstem response, or ABR, is a form of an auditory evoked potential. And that's a classification of, of multiple tests uh, that measures the integrity of the ascending pathway beyond the cochlea, usually to the lower brainstem. But for some tests, um, they can really go more centrally to the, cor to the cortex of the brain. What we're measuring is a time lock change in the EEG in response to an auditory stimulus. Um, and the latencies of these changes correlate to specific areas along the pathway. So the early responses, or waves one through five, are referred to the ABR, and that's what's used diagnostically and clinically. And then you have your middle and your late potentials, which are really used um, in research right now or are not clinically being performed. Okay, so when do we recommend or perform an ABR? Um, well, when we want to estimate thresholds for a child who we're, in which we're suspecting a hearing loss. Um, when we're, we need to evaluate, can that signal that's being sent from the cochlea fire in a synchronous manner, in a normal manner, or is the problem what we call retrocochlear, that the, the sound does not travel up through the pathway in, in the manner in which it could and, and most effectively should. Um, it's sensitive to actual lesions that may occur along that auditory nerve. Um, and is helpful in those who cannot receive an MRI. And it's the screening tool that we're using in the high-risk population for um, children who have prolonged NICU or NICU stays. There are many, many, many different names for ABR. Um, and it's just important for you to be aware of them so that you know, oh, if somebody says to you, oh, well, did your child have a bear? And you're like, well, what the heck is a bear? Was that what they were supposed to have a bear? Um, so just so you know the different names, we can use the term ABR or AEP, auditory evoked potential. Again, the bear, or BAER, is the brainstem auditory evoked response, uh, the BAEP. These, are all, these three are all diagnostic evaluations. When we add an A to the beginning, as an A, a, ABR or an ABAR, these are automated tests, and these are what we're using to screen for hearing loss. Um, so it's different because we're using different types of stimuli and with different goals in mind. So the test environment for an ABR is a little unique. We really need to limit um, patient noise or myogenic noise. Um, and we need to limit this for a prolonged period of time. You know, this isn't like, OK, sit like a statue for a minute. This is, OK, we really need this child to sleep for an hour or more. Um, they're extremely sensitive to electrical interference, including nearby medical equipment, elevators, cell phones, um, more so Android than iPhones. I always will have um, patients and um, other providers turn off their, their, cell, turn their cell phones and their iPhones completely off. And the same can be said for, said for um, other devices with Bluetooth. Your environmental noise can be slightly higher, though, as when we're testing autoacoustic emissions. So it's OK for mom and dad to talk while we're testing, as long as it doesn't interrupt the child sleeping. And it's helpful if the patient is lying down so that they can really sleep or relax. Um, this can be challenging in the adult patient um, and can be extremely challenging, but not impossible in the child. Most times when ABRs are recommended, we do recommend them with sedation, depending on the patient's age. Um, but we can test unsedated. Infants up to four months of age are usually tested um, unsedated, provided that uh, you guys cooperate with us. So you bring us a cranky, tired, hungry baby. And then we will prep the area for, ha for how we're going to do the test. And then we'll say, OK, 
now feed them, change them, and put them to sleep. And that can take an hour. Um, but then once that child is sleeping, the, the goal is that we'll be able to get all the information we need to without having to sedate your child. Very rarely, um, we've been able to test children who can be sleep deprived, so we leave them up all night, or who routinely sleep long naps and cannot be sedated. Um, at our center, I will try to test an older child once unsedated. Um, and if I'm completely unsuccessful, then I will recommend a sedated ABR. But if I get a good amount of information, I'll say, okay, now let's do this again. When we can't test a child unsedated, that's when we will refer to an ENT, an ear, nose, and throat specialist, for sedation. And this can be done um, either with a local or with a general anesthesia. Okay, so this is just a picture of a baby um, with different, hooked up for an ABR with different electrodes. So generally you'll see one on the forehead, sometimes two in the high forehead and then one on the side, and then one either behind the earlobe or on the portion that's right behind your, your pinna, which we call the mastoid. And then there'll be inserts that go into the patient's ears also. And that's what's actually delivering the stimulus. And these electrodes that are just stickers um, are what are recording the response. There are two types of stimuli that can be used for an ABR. One is a click um, and one is a tone burst. And we want to use a click when we're testing to see how well that auditory nerve can fire and can it fire in a synchronous manner. And we use a click when we're screening for hearing loss. When we're Doing an ABR to establish thresholds and estimate thresholds that can be plotted on an audiogram, we want to use tone bursts. We want to use short in sounds that are short in duration but are close to a specific center frequency that correlates to our behavioral testing. Um, and the reason we do this is because your cochlea actually responds to different sounds in what's called a tonotopic manner, so a very specific place of your cochlea will respond to a low frequency sound, and then a different area will respond to a high frequency sound. When we use a click, we risk stimulating that whole area, and we don't find out about those sloping hearing losses. And also, we want to be able to program your child's hearing aids based on the information we're getting from the ABR and we need that frequency specific information so that we can amplify appropriately. So our threshold estimation ABR is the only diagnostic tool that we can use to estimate thresholds in patients who either cannot or will not perform behavioral audiometry. Um, and that's you know, our sound booth testing. They allow the audiologist to obtain frequency specific thresholds to program those hearing aids um, and what we're actually doing is measuring the lowest level a neural response, which we call wave 5, can be reliably obtained. Um, so when do we recommend a threshold estimation ABR? In a child or a newborn who refer their newborn hearing screening and follow-up screening um, when they have no middle ear, um, no poor middle ear health at the, same, at the same time. In all newborns who are born with either a unilateral or bilateral, so one ear or two ears, um, microtia or atresia, um, and that's when there is no opening to the, uh, to the pinna, where we actually can't place a probe to, uh, to screen, and we know at that point that there is some degree of hearing loss, but we need to check the integrity of that inner ear of that cochlea. Um, and we will sometimes recommend them in children, in newborns or children with craniofacial anomalies that are associated with hearing loss who don't pass their newborn hearing screening. So these are children with cleft lip and um, endor palate or Down syndrome when we're concerned about a chronic conductive hearing loss. The Joint Committee on Infant Health is really the gold standard in our new universal newborn hearing screening protocols in this country. Um, in 2007, they changed their position statement on diagnosis of children with hearing loss. And now they recommend that all children under three who have been diagnosed with a sensory neural hearing loss receive an ABR to confirm behavioral findings. So even if your child is completely, you know, what we call testable, 
in the sound booth and we're able to get a solid hearing test on them, we need to confirm that hearing loss with an ABR. Um, and this is especially important if a cochlear implant is being um, considered for your child. So if you have a child who is under three, who was diagnosed with a sensory neural hearing loss and then hasn't had an ABR, please call your audiologist tomorrow and try to find out why. So for our threshold estimation, we have some different recording parameters. We're going to test generally three to four frequencies. Um, I test 500 hertz, 2,000, and 4,000 routinely. Most times I skip 1,000 hertz, and that's just because I have to usually um, bypass that ear with that earphone and then test the cochlea directly. And I'm either doing this when I'm afraid the child's going to wake up and I have to get as much information as I can in a rapid manner, or we're in the operating room and I don't want your child to be under anesthesia for any longer than they absolutely have to be. Um, the polarity of our stimulus may vary, the rate may vary, the recording window, um, but the most important thing is that if you see a response on their waveforms that's considered threshold and they're marking it as threshold or the lowest level that that child can hear, it must be replicated. It cannot be on that um, ABR one time or on your printout one time. You also want to keep in mind that our estimated thresholds need to be converted um, from what's called an N, a DB NHL or neural threshold to an estimated threshold. If the ABR report doesn't say it in, uh, isn't specific, you want to call the audiologist to ask because if that audiologist is not dispensing hearing aids for your child, you don't want the hearing aid dispenser to double convert, in which case we may be under amplifying or over amplifying. And just keep in mind that there is no conversion when we're testing bone conduction and that's when we're bypassing that outer and that middle ear to stimulate the cochlea directly. Okay. So this is an example of what we call latency intensity function. Okay, so you can see a nice normal wave one, three, and five. And this would be a click and then for your tone bursts, although they're not usually laid out on the same page. You can see that as your intensity or your, your volume decreases, your latency or where that response occurs increases. So you can see a beautiful replication here uh, down to a normal hearing level. And it looks very similar, although a little different um, in an adult. All right, so now we're going to move on to our subjective testing or our booth. This is actually one of our booths, our pediatric booth. So our subjective testing requires a behavioral response from the child, um, and it establishes threshold, which is really the lowest level a patient can reliably respond at least half of the time in two out of three or th two out of four or three out of six trials, and it includes our pure tones and our speech audiometry. Things that as an audiologist we're thinking about as we're saying hello and talking to your child as we walk you down the hallway are the child's age, their apparent intellect. Um, any comorbid conditions that we're concerned about. You know, their visual acuity, do they wear glasses? Their dexterity, is this a child that I think can hold a small block or do I need to move to a bigger toy? And how mobile are they? Um, and that really has to do with how long do I think they're going to sit in the chair for? There are different types of ways to deliver the sound to the patient. That's called the transducer. And they give us different information. Our sound field or our speakers are the, give us the least information because it's not ear specific. Um, then we can also use headphones or inserts. In children, generally two and under, I tend to use inserts over headphones um, just because they're more comfortable. They're kind of like wearing earbuds over, you know, headphones. Um, and so your sound field, your headphones and your inserts all tells you how much hearing loss there is or the degree of hearing loss. The bone oscillator, that little square piece that they put behind your child's ear, is used to condition um, and it determines what kind of hearing loss the child has. Is it a hearing loss because that, that there's congestion in the middle ear and the, that eardrum isn't moving or is it a hearing loss because there's a problem in that cochlea or beyond? So again, we're using frequency-specific stimuli, 
and speech also. And for our speech testing, we're estimating our threshold, the lowest level a child will respond to speech. And we're testing how well they can understand speech at a louder intensity, at a conversational volume. When we're testing frequencies, um, everybody tests a little bit differently. I tend to ear hop and frequency hop. So I'll do, you know, right then left at one frequency and then uh, right then left at another frequency just to try to get the most information. Most facilities test 500, 1000, 2000, and 4000 hertz with children. Um, if your child has an established sensory neural hearing loss or established conductive um, long standing hearing loss, then you really need to, your audiologist needs to be testing further frequencies. You know, that only gives us a little snippet of information. We need more. And sometimes this is done in one session, and sometimes this is done in four sessions. Um, there is a, when we're testing speech audiometry, it's important to know there's a difference between a speech awareness threshold, or an SAT, and a speech recognition threshold, an SRT. A speech awareness threshold is, is just the lowest level a child can hear sound. Um, so it's generally softer than the level, the lowest level they can identify sound. Um, and we'll do an SRT either with having them repeat words or point to words like hot dog, ice cream, baseball, french fry, Batman, Elmo. Um, or we'll have them point to a body part. Show me your nose, show me your eyes, show me your shoes, where's mommy? Things like that. Because the SRT requires a child to not only hear the word, but recognize what it is to make a response um, versus just hearing a sound and throwing a ball in a bucket. When we're testing our speech discrimination ability, or it's sometimes called word recognition score, um, you just know that's the, that's the number that's in the percentage on your report or on your audiogram. Um, and it's an ability to, to uh, how well can that child repeat unfamiliarized speech at, at a conversational or super threshold level. Um, most times we like to do it with unfamiliarized speech, which is also called an open set because it can be any word in that child's language. But more often with children, we're using a closed set task such as the WIPI, which is the word intelligibility by picture identification test. Um, and that's, you know, you'll see there's a picture book with six different pictures on it. The tester will say a word and the child will point to that word. Um, it's used to assess potential or actual benefit from hearing aids, cochlear implants, or bone conduction hearing aids. We can test a child uh, using these measures to see how they respond in the, present, in the presence of competing background noise. You know, and if this is a child who has a hearing loss that we're not quite sure if we're going to recommend hearing aids for, then this can be a very valuable asset to us. Um, there are many different words lists, word lists. We just need to make sure as the audiologist that we're picking one that's language age appropriate versus chronological age appropriate. This is all fine and dandy, but like how do we actually do this? And there are four main ways that we are testing in our sound field, in our sound booth. Um, in children under five, the gold standard is two audiologist testing. It doesn't always happen. Um, and the technique is often adjusted based on the abilities of the child. So we're saying, you know, nine months, we're going to test behavioral observation audiometry. Between nine months and three years, we're going to do our visual reinforced or our VRA. And then from three to five conditioned play. Um, and then by five years, a child should be able to raise their hand when they hear a sound. And that's very true. However, um, it really depends on the child. If this is a child who maybe not isn't getting early intervention or isn't in uh, speech therapy, they may not, or doesn't go to school, they might not be able to do condition play at three years. As opposed to a child, who, and most of our children with hearing loss who receive EI, can do condition play at three, um, before three, because they can sit in a chair and they, they know, okay, this is what I do and this is how we play our games. They have that structure. Um, having said that, there are many times there I have a seven or eight year old who has a sensory neural hearing loss and I will test them with condition play audiometry because I need a lot of information and I want to make sure I get the best and the most accurate test. And it's not wrong, it's just you, you have to decide, you know, you can choose your technique. You want to use the technique that's going to give you the most and most reliable, the best and the most reliable information. So when we're testing our BOA, um, you have to test with two audiologists, it's not an option. 
because your the response has to be agreed upon by both clinicians because it is a little um, different. You know, this could be a child that consistently every single time you present a sound, they cry, or every single time you present a sound, they smile. So you have to first feel out the child to see what their response is going to be, and then the two of you have to agree on it and re re agree on all of the responses. When we're testing for VRA or visual reinforced, that's when the child is also on your lap, um, and it's a conditioned response. So the tester is going to present a signal, a stimuli, sometimes it's voice or tone, and simultaneously they'll get a, the child will get a reward, a video screen or that toy that's in the box that scares everyone. Um, at a loud, but not uncomfortably loud level, and we're going to teach the child to turn in response to the sound. And we, have to made, have, we may have to do this a couple of times during the session, but after the child is conditioned, we're going to lower the intensity, and then we'll establish our threshold. When we're testing conditioned play, we're doing something very similar. First, we'll um, teach the child how to respond at a loud level using a hand-over-hand -hand technique. Um, and then we will establish our threshold, and it can be done with blocks or pegboards or poking the child's nose and clapping, really anything that's going to give us a, a, a reliable response. Okay. So this next slide is a little intense. Um, it's really on putting everything together, but the takeaway from it is you have your technique, okay, and there are many different ways that you can test with that technique. You can test with a bone oscillator on a child under than, younger than nine months. You can put ear phones in a child between nine months and three years to get ear specific information when you're not doing play, when you're doing VRA. So that's the most important thing for you to realize um, is our technique and the information that we get from the technique is very varied and it's interchangeable. Um, and as audiologists, we really need to be very, very dynamic. If you have a child with a hearing loss and your audiologist is not routinely testing them ear specific, um, that's a concern that I would have as a professional and, and you should have as a parent because we really need ear specific information on these kids. All right, so now we're going to talk about our audiogram interpretations. Um, and we're going to, I'm not really going to go over this in depth, but just be aware that we like to use acronyms, um, and we're really trying to push not to, but, and we apologize when we do, um, but some different abbreviations that you've probably seen most often, the A-D-A-S-A-U, A refers to uh, ear, or oral, with an A-A-U-R-A-L, and the D is always right, S is always left, and U is both. So when we're talking about an audiogram, the audiogram is just a graph. It's just a visual representation of, every, of the lowest level that your child threw that block in the bucket when they heard the sound. But it represents the degree, the type, and the configuration of the hearing loss. Okay, so this is our audiogram of familiar sounds. Okay, right here is what we call the speech banana. It's the level at which you can, a uh, sound is produced and the child needs to have access to that sound in order to be able to hear it and then to learn to produce it. Horizontally on here, you, on this graph, you have your pitch or your frequency. From low frequency, like a foghorn, to high frequency, like a whistle. And then up and down, you have your volume from very, very soft to very, very loud. And this one is very nice because it also gives you at what level um, different sounds happen, like a piano, a baby crying. For a child, everything above this blue line is considered normal hearing. Okay? Um, and as a point of reference for you, normal conversational speech happens about 55 decibels. So if your child's threshold levels, the lowest level that they can hear, is be between like 45 and 55 decibels, a moderate hearing loss, the volume I'm speaking at right now sounds like a whisper to that child. And that's not sufficient for them to be able to, to learn to speak on their own. They're really going to need amplification um, to give them access to these sounds because they, they can't hear them at this point in time. So this is very similar. This is also an audiogram, but this just highlights the different degrees of hearing loss that occur from normal, slight, mild, moderate, moderately severe, severe, and profound. Uh, your audiogram should always have a legend, so there are symbols. 
your right ear, if it's in color, will always be red, red, right, round, round symbol. And then your, your left ear is always going to be the X, and it'll be in blue. Um, and then just know that if your child has an asymmetrical hearing loss or hearing loss that's different in both ears, you might see what's called a masked symbol. You know, it's a triangle for the right ear and a square for the left ear. Your bone conduction responses, the responses that occur when they bi we bypass that middle ear to test the cochlea directly, will be either a carrot, uh, the greater than or equal to sign, I'm sorry, the greater than or less than sign, and they reference the patient. So imagine the head is here, this would be the right ear. Imagine the head is here, this would be your left ear. Um, and if they're masked, they look like an open bracket or a closed bracket. If a child doesn't respond to the limits of the equipment, you'll see that the no response is in, uh, designated by a downwards arrow. And we're for testing in the sound field, you'll just have an S. I'm sure that you're all familiar with the different types of hearing loss. Um, we have our, there are three types. Our conductive, which is when your air conduction responses are not within normal limits. But your bone conduction responses, when we're bypassing that, out, that outer and middle ear, are normal. Um, and the difference really has to be greater than or equal to 15 decibels. And we call that an air bone gap. Our sensory neural hearing loss occurs when our air conduction and our bone conduction are both impaired. Um, but they're, they're about equal with, you know, less than or greater than, I'm sorry, greater than or equal to 10 dB between them. Our mixed hearing losses occur when the air conduction and the bone conduction are, not e are both impaired, but they're not equal when you have those air bone gaps. And this is very common in a child with a sensory neural hearing loss who then develops a middle ear effusion or fluid. Okay, so this is just an audiogram of a conductive hearing loss. So again, this is your air conduction. This is your headphones. And then we're bypassing that outer and that middle ear to test the cochlea directly, and there's a healthy cochlea there versus the sensory neural hearing loss where, and this is what we considered a slight sloping to severe sensory neural hearing loss bilaterally, where both your bone conduction and your air conduction are equal but impaired, um, as opposed to your mixed hearing loss where your bone conduction does not equal your air conduction, but they are, all, they are both impaired, neither is normal. Okay. So now we're going to move on to our recommendations. Um, so there are some initial mandatory recommendations that need to be made when a child with hearing loss is diagnosed. Um, and some of those are made by audiologists and some are made by ENT. So children of all ages, when they're diagnosed with a, either a permanent conductive hearing loss, so one that's not caused by fluid or congestion in the ears, or one that's a sensory neural hearing loss, need to see an ENT. And they need to see an ENT that is either a pediatric ENT who sees a lot of children with sensory neural hearing loss or permanent conductive hearing losses, or an otologist. And an otologist is an ENT who specializes just in the ears. If you can find one in your area that does both, that's ideal. Um, and the ENT is going to make some recommendations also. They're probably going to send you to see a geneticist. They're probably going to send you for imaging. They want to look at the MRI. They want an MRI and a CT to look at the structures um, to make sure that everything is intact. Your child should see the audiologist at least every six months, more often if you're concerned, or if your audiologist is also dispensing hearing aids and that child is outgrowing their ear molds. Um, they should see an eye doctor, an eye doctor um, or ophthalmology. And it's not that we're necessarily concerned that every child with a hearing loss is also um, visually impaired, but we just we want to rule it out. We don't want children who, you know, maybe are a little nearsighted and need glasses walking around with two senses impaired. I mean, most states will have um, a hearing loss registry and the audiologist will register your child. Additional recommendations from birth to three years, we're going to do an ABR to confirm the behavioral findings. And we're going to refer you to early intervention. And between three to five years, you're going to be referred to the uh, Committee for Preschool Special Education that works through your school district. And they will generally do the same evaluations. Um, at the very least, your child should be getting teacher of the deaf or hard of hearing services. Hopefully, they're also qualified for speech language therapy. And then if there are also other areas that um, are not age appropriate, they will be getting services through those groups. 
And when we're, when we're recommending amplification, we are always recommending binaural, so both ears, if the hearing loss is symmetrical and in, um, if the hearing loss is symmetrical and in, in both ears. We want to use a hearing, pediatric hearing aid, um, and we want it to be fit with a pediatric rationale because your two-year-old's ears are not the same size as your adult's ears, and that's your ear canal, really, the difference. We want to make sure that we're not over or under amplifying the child with functional gain testing and real ear assessment. We want to make sure that we're using tamper resistant battery doors because batteries are toxic. Um, we're going to recommend a larger ear mold, both because ear molds are a choking hazard and because they provide a better fit as the child continues to grow. Um, I always recommend use of a retention cord so that they're not lost, even when they're covered by insurance. Um, Any time without a hearing aid is not ideal. And we want to make sure that they're FM compatible for when that child reaches school age. So now, uh, very quickly, I'm just going to go through recommendations for the school age child because I know I'm running out of time. Right, oh, sorry, Nancy, I just saw you think. Okay, so Alyssa wanted to know um, what recommendations do you give for parents whose infants or kids and toddlers won't keep their hearing aids in? you kind of have to be the bad person. And it's really hard to recommend that um, because it's really painful for you to have to, you know, to put this on your child, but you know that at the end it, it is in their best interest. I never recommend a reward system. Um, you know, a child who wears their hearing aids gets a cookie or um, a sticker just because it, it prolongs the inevitable and it can be uh, difficult. If you just keep putting them back in or putting them back on, putting the cochlear implant back on, Eventually, the game is going to be up, and they will continue to to, um, to wear it. For retention, you may want to put um, a hat on the child just so that they're not flinging they're not you know flinging it off also or taking it off. Okay. Um, and I'm going to hold your question till the end because I do want to get through these recommendations. But if anybody else has any other questions, just feel free to type them as we go. Um, so the most important thing for a child, a school-aged child, is we want to improve the signal-to-noise ratio. And that's known as the SNR. And the SNR is the difference between how loud the signal in the room is and, or the speaker and the noise. A positive SNR is ideal. It means that the speaker is so many decibels louder than the noise versus a negative SNR when the noise is actually louder than the speech. Um, some important little information for you. A child with normal hearing requires a minimum of an uh, SNR of pl plus 6 dB to effectively learn. A child with a slight to mild only will perform 13% poorer than a child with normal hearing at the same signal-to-noise ratio. And at a signal-to-noise ratio of 9 to 6 dB, a child with a slight to mild hearing loss performs 33% poorer than a child with normal hearing. So think about your children um, who may have greater than a mild hearing loss and how they're performing when it's noisy. So when is it worse in the classroom? Um, when, during transition times, when you've got your books closed and your desks moving and your kids talking. And that's really the most important time in the classroom. Because at that point, that's when your, your child is missing instructions on what we're doing next. You know, the teacher will say, close your social studies textbook, and every kid plops that textbook closed, and then your child missed, OK, now open your math textbook. They'll miss assignments. Um, and they'll miss the teacher when they're starting to switch classes say, oh, by the way, read pages, you know, 210 to 245 and you're going to have a quiz on Wednesday because they didn't hear it above, you know, who's talking and who's moving around the room already. So how do we fix this? When you go for your child's individualized educational plan or IEP, you want to have written instructions added. So either whether it be on Blackboard, a smart board, or um, emailed to you, of, you know, whether it be assignments, all instructions should be written for your child. Um, some schools will allow use of a note taker, whether it be the teacher provide notes for the student or a, a student who's good in the class that does well will provide notes, um, but it is important that they don't identify your child as the child who's getting the notes. Audiologists always recommend preferential classroom seating, and I'll talk about that in a minute, and we may recommend an FM system. Um, so. Preferential classroom seating means that the teacher, the student's going to sit by the teacher, which is great in theory, but it doesn't always work. Um, it's only helpful if the teacher stands directly in front of the classroom. 
I'm sorry, stands directly in front of, of the student at all times and never faces the, the, the board. Um, and if your audiologist is recommending preferential collection seating, please tell them to be specific. What ear needs to be closer to the teacher, separate them from windows and doors, maintain eye contact. I know it's unrealistic, but I still write it in all my reports. Um, an FM system may also be helpful because it places the voice of the speaker direct closer to the listener. And there are two parts, the transmitter and the receiver. Um, and it can be delivered in a variety of ways, both to all students in a classroom, which can be more cost effective if there are multiple children with hearing loss, um, at desk level, which is called a sound box or a bag, or what I always recommend is an ear specific, um, because that puts that child, that teacher right in that child's ear. For, uh, either through headphones or in your receiver. Um, you want your audiologist to make specific recommendations. It needs to be programmed by an educational audiologist. Somebody at school has to be made in charge of charging, uh, should be put in charge of charging the FM system, and you'd be surprised how many times that's forgotten. And every teacher should use it. It should be in the child's IEP, and I make the exception of Jim, because I don't want them to break. Um, as your children as old child grows and they start to switch classes, that FM system is going to have to move with them. So ask that a log be included in the IEP so that the back of the FM system has this log that each of the teachers has to sign um, so that A, they're using it, and if it's lost or broken, we have a responsible party. Um, and then you can ask that that copy of the log be sent home to you at a particular interval. OK, one final thing, and then we'll get really quickly to questions, and I apologize for running over. Um, you know your child better than anybody. You know their child certainly better than me who meets them very quickly. Um, give us suggestions on what you think will be best for your child. If you know your child is afraid of the monkey in the box when you're meeting a new audiologist, please tell us. Or, you know, we have a video system with Dora. If your child hates Dora, please tell me. Um, you know, if there are words that I'm using that your child doesn't know but you know words that they know better, that's very helpful when I'm trying to assess to see how they're doing with their, with their hearing aids or cochlear implant. Um, ask us for rationale of why we want, you know, why we're recommending something. You know, we are pushed to provide evidence-based practice, and I love when parents ask me, but, but why do I need to do this? And it really does empower you, and, and then you can empower, you know, your child's teachers and other individuals. Okay, some references for you and questions. Unfortunately, Nicole, I think um, we're going to have to end it because Deanna had to uh, go to another assignment. Um, but I would like to invite you back to present. I think uh, somebody had questioned um, or commented that it would be great if you could do another webinar and focus more just on um, a child and how to help your child in the school setting. So um, you and I, I guess, will chat about that because um, that sounds like it would be very popular as well. Um, so I thank you very much and I thank everybody for attending tonight. As, um, as you all know, it's been recorded and as soon as I can possibly um, do it, I will clean up the transcript and get it um, posted online. Just a word of caution, I'm a few weeks away from convention and I'm also on a two-week jury trial. I'm on the jury, so um, my time has been rather limited. But in any event, um, I, we will get it posted as soon as possible. And again, thank you so much, Nicole, and um, I'll be in touch. You're very, well, you're very welcome, Nancy. I'm just going to put my email in here in case anybody does have any questions. I'll sure. put it right in the chat box. And I know MB, you had some questions about becoming a pediatric audiologist. Feel free to email me. Okay. Um, Katie, the um, recording will be on the webinar page of our um, website. And I would not look for it much before uh, probably a week or two from now uh, just to give me time. It, it takes a little bit of time to go through and listen to uh, the webinar and correct the, tri the transcript because I want to get it as clean as possible. But um, uh, it will be there. And uh, again, thank you, Nicole. And I'll sign off this evening. Uh, good night, everybody. And um, oh, one more thing, if everybody can still hear me. Um, 
Joan Haber, a former Board of Trustee um, of HLAA, will present about the convention um, on June the 18th. Everything you want to know about convention. She also moderates the newcomers uh, session at convention, so she's well versed in the convention. She's going to be attending her 16th consecutive uh, convention, and we're, so we're looking forward to that. All right, again, thanks everybody for attending this evening. Thanks again, Nicole, and take care. Bye-bye.